Hey, this is John with Two Moose Home Inspections and welcome to the December 2020 in-service training. Well, 2020 was one heck of a year, but uh, we made it and it's 2021. So that's a good thing. Thank you for joining us on this in-service training. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we are going to be pulling up Notion and inside of our Notion, we have our December 2020 in-service training. You may have already seen the October and the November in-service training. So thank you for joining us on that. Um, now that we have it loaded, let's get started with a few things. So first off, let's talk safety. Um, Safety, what an interesting topic. Uh, this topic, I've been racking my brain for a while and I've been putting in a lot of effort and a lot of work, basically doing a threat analysis, if you wanna think of it as that for, for Two Moose Home Inspections. And with that, like so many things that could go wrong, so many things, and you would think, oh, it's a home, you should be safe at a home. That's correct. But if you're inspecting a home, there's a lot of ways that you could be very unsafe. Um, one of the most interesting things that came up with that is tourniquets. And you might be like, John, you're crazy. What, what tourniquets are like really for real? And so after looking at the numbers, the statistics, uh, so on and so forth, if you were to fall off a ladder and you were to fall and break, let's say like your femur, if you had a femoral bleed, you would be dead within three minutes. Realistically, you'd be unconscious for like sooner than that, but you'd be dead within three minutes. And so I was like, okay, well, I, I don't think we're gonna fall off our ladders. And, but if we did, how much is a tourniquet? Okay, like 30 bucks. Okay, so you put a $30 tourniquet onto an inspector and then that could potentially save their lives. Same if they fell and they broke their wrist and a bone is protruding. Uh, if they cut themselves uh, while you know working with sheet metal with an HVAC system, or let's say um, they're closing an old window and that old window as um, it's a double hung window. And a lot of times those aren't supported. So as soon as you unlock it, sometimes that upper pane can fall or whenever you put the lower pane up, that can fall out. And if that glass falls out, and let's say it cuts their arms. Oh man, is this too graphic? This is probably too graphic. Anyway, long story short, tourniquets. Surprisingly, um, a smart investment. The odds of having to deploy a tourniquet, very, very, very minimal. But I think for $30, the fact that you could save someone's life, or, um, you know, I was talking to a customer one time and he said that whenever he was a kid, um, that he actually ran through a completely like all glass window. Now, these windows should be tempered if they're a certain size and meet certain you know requirements as far as like how high off the ground they are or are not, how big it is, how, actually how many square feet worth of window there is. Um, and so whenever he was a kid, he was running and chasing and whatever, and he ran right through the glass pane whenever his parents were looking to buy a brand new house. And it was the realtor that actually saved his life, which is crazy. Uh, I can't believe like that story in general, but. Could you imagine if a home inspector had the tools on hand to be able to at least do the first uh, the first aid portion of that, which brings us to the uh, the second part, which is first aid. And so all of our inspectors have had like whatever they carry with them for first aid, but we, for whatever reason, did not supply our inspectors with first aid equipment. We just never thought about it. After doing this whole safety assessment, wow, like eye opening. So all of our inspectors are gonna be getting safety um, kits that meet the standards that are required. Um, so that way everybody is safe and can manage just about everything. Um, so that's that. All right, moving on. Um, if we take a look at some of our updates, so we got uh, Christmas gifts handed out to our employees. Uh, we also have Christmas gifts handed out to our realtors. Um, we have uh, 15 new short report videos. So if we take a look, um, then these right here are our short report videos. And um, we have 15 new ones. And so what you might also see is that we have just a whole bunch of videos and we have our October in-service training. We have uh, our November in-service training. We have stuff about how to use reports, COVID-19, uh, most importantly for our realtors. So that way they know exactly what we're all about. And um, as you move down, we have a whole bunch of other video topics. Um, I believe right now we're up to 45 videos on the site, but um, yeah, that's pretty cool. So. Uh, moving on, uh, whenever we take a look at um, report writing, so basically what I have empowered our inspectors to do and what I want them to do is I want them to kind of uh, add their own personal touches, their own personal flair, I guess, if you want to call it that. I'm not requiring pieces of flair, but um, the the idea behind this is that I want the inspectors that if they had a conversation with somebody about something, it's great to reference that in the report. It's great to add a little additional insight um, if you know that the person who is buying the house may be 
uh, worried or concerned and whatever, and you're worried that this one little thing might, you know, set them over the edge, it's important to just put that piece of information in there, let them know everything's fine. It's all good. And, um, and I think that's like, I don't know, really cool. I don't, I don't want us to be so sterile and buy the book and just every inspector does the same thing. Granted, I do want us to have consistency. And that's what we do have, because since we have W-2 employees, that means that we are very consistent because I can dictate how they dress, I can dictate how they talk, I can dictate what software they use and how many photos they take and all of this, which is great, but I don't want to take their personal expertise out of the picture. And so we are just, you know, during this in-service training, just making sure they are aware that they have free reign if they want to say something in the report, you know, obviously good things. Um, I wouldn't want them to be, you know, off base, but to be able to just say, hey, here's something we talked about. Here's some thoughts, something, something, a little food for t food for thought, whatever. Um, so anyway, just good, good conversation pieces there. So let's go ahead and jump into some of the deficiencies. And um, yeah, first off, uh, if it's red, it might kill you. It doesn't mean it's expensive though. So if it's red, it's fine. Just get it fixed. That's a what a ten dollar fix, maybe. Maybe if you want to get really fancy and get an electronic lock that you can control from anywhere through a Wi-Fi, um, uh, not through Wi-Fi, through WAN, wide area network, anyway, it doesn't matter. So that you can control over the internet, um, then you could go ahead and put one of those in. And yeah, that might cost you $100, $200, whatever it may be, but you could probably get this lock replaced for $10. Now, why is it this can kill you? So this can kill you because let's say there's a fire and that key is not there, but it's dead bolted shut. There's no way to exit this, this condo without kicking down the door, but you can't really kick down the door because the way it's opening and it's just not safe. Anytime that you have a keyed lock on the inside, that's just, that cannot be. You need to have a little um, thing that you can turn by hand without the need of a key in case of an emergency. Easy fix, but it's red because obviously unsafe. So moving on, uh, ground wire not connected. So uh, you can see the ground wire right there. It's 100% not, uh, not connected and that's not great. Um, because that means that if there was an electrical issue, then the switch could, could become electrified. Uh, or, you know, let's say they are passing through the ground in a certain way, perhaps other, um, devices, receptacles, switches, whatever, they may not be, um, grounded as you go down the line. And so we just want to make sure that if, if the wiring is there, just do it correctly, wire things correctly. So again, because it's a ground, that's a health safety issue, which is why it's in red. Um, so then. Uh, here's another one here. So basically, um, the homeowners association, uh, we basically say, Hey, here's some action items for a home, uh, and the homeowners and whatever. The thing is, is that the, these are things that the homeowners association might fix depending on what the agreement is. And then they might not. So keep in mind, uh, we have a video about how you actually are the homeowners association, how you are the one that is paying into it. So therefore anything that you say, the homeowners association is going to repair. That's actually you paying for it out of pocket. Just it first goes into like, uh, you know, a treasury and then it gets paid for through there. So the issue with this is that there are a lot of cracks, which means a lot of water, free stop, free stop, free stop. And what you can see is that we actually had a heat taped drainage pipe um, that was allowing water to thaw, come through the drainage pipe. And then where it was going was into just a regular, um, you know, floor drain on the exterior that had no heat tape, no nothing. So what happens? Uh, all that uh, water goes in there, it then freeze thaw, freeze thaw, all those pipes guaranteed to be broken. But in addition to that, um, then that just freezes shut. And then once that's fro frozen shut, um, then all the water is just going to build up around it and everything that is coming off of the roof, that's great. The roof is being cleared of uh, of water, the, well, snow and ice, which is water. So is being cleared of snow and ice, which turns into water, goes down the downspout, the downspout then pours it onto the floor, which then freezes and could potentially flood the house. So just, if you're gonna run heat tape, you have to follow the water to its final destination. You can't just give up because it's made it through the gutter. You need to know where is that water discharging to. So something to be aware of. I don't know why people are trying to kill me. I swear, people are constantly trying to kill me. Um, whenever I opened up the circuit panel, we had a live wire. And this live wire, I don't know if you can see in this photo, but it was in the corner and it was like ever so barely just touching on the, the sheathing of the wire, the, the non-electrified portion. And if it would have just gone like that, it would have electrified the whole box. Now, whenever I say electrified the whole box, I mean, it would have caused a short circuit, which could potentially cause a fire, this, that, the other, or if it were to touch the, the front door. And as I pulled that door off, it could kill me. That would be bad. I don't want to die. Um, ideally. So, uh, anyway, 
basically the, the reason that this happens is normally because they have power going to something um, that is 240 volts, which means that we have a hot, hot, and a neutral, and then there should also be a ground, but if it's a three prong or a four prong, hot, hot, and neutral. And so what happens is that sometimes um, whenever you turn on an, app, uh, an appliance, that power can jump through, and if that appliance is only wired, you know, let's say to run 120 volts, um, then great. Um, but the reality is um, that we, <laughs> If, if you have a wire being terminated, whether it is live, dead, whatever, we don't know what could happen downstream. What we can do is we can take responsibility in the moment to make the area that you are in safe. The idea is who's the next guy? Who's the next guy that's gonna be working on it? Whenever you have an electrician putting in new electrical stuff, who's the next guy? Every piece of work that they do is for the next guy. Same thing here. Just because you terminate, you don't terminate a certain wire and you think, okay, because it's not connected to the main panel means it's fine. No, if I open up a junction box and I use a wire nut and I connect the wires, I say, oh, here's a red wire. I'm gonna put all the red wires together. Then I could have just electrified that wire on a totally different circuit than what you, the original person were intending. So pretty, pretty please, wire nut. So now we carry, because this is like the fourth time that this has happened in like two months, now we carry electrical tape on everything and we'll just put electrical tape on those ends because who's the next guy? Who's the next person to be hurt? And who that normally is, is our client. And we do not want our client to be hurt because we saw an issue and then nobody fixed it and then it actually became a real issue. So things like this, we will step in, intervene, um, and make sure the person is safe. So the next thing, um, condensate neutralizers. So because you have a high efficiency um, boiler or furnace or whatever it may be, how do you know if it's high efficiency? Fresh air comes in through a plastic pipe, exhaust goes out through a plastic pipe. If the exhaust is going out through a metal pipe, then it is not high efficiency, it's medium efficiency. But high efficiency, because it just is so efficient, it doesn't lose any of that heat, it actually um, creates condensation. And that condensation um, is going to be slightly acidic. And whenever that's acidic, um, that'll damage your pipes. It could set off the pH um, in your septic, uh, which would mean that your septic system isn't gonna work the way that it's intended. Um, it could also have unforeseen consequences down the line uh, with our municipalities for their uh, sewage treatment. And so what we really wanna do is we wanna just spend you know, the 30, $40, put in one of these neutralizers, replace the cartridge every year, and just be done with it. So that way we know that we aren't damaging the internals of our pipes and we aren't damaging any other utility um, that our, our drainage is connected to. So garage separation, ooh, it's in red, it means it'll kill you. Well, not necessarily kill you, but um, in a lot of cases, it puts you at a lot of risk that you don't need to be in. Uh, and so, okay, so this door doesn't close. So what? All my doors in my house don't close. Well, I mean, like they close whenever I want them to, but they don't close on their own. So then why does this one need to be? So this one needs to be because if that garage uh, door is not closed, and let's say there's um, fumes from like a gasoline tank or um, somebody uh, propane leaks uh, because we store the propane in the garage for whatever reason, uh, or the vehicle comes in, the vehicle's off gassing, or the vehicle's running and, um, and we have all that carbon monoxide, we need to have that separation. Secondarily, if there is a fire, that door needs to be shut so we can try to contain that fire inside of the garage instead of allowing it to spread through the entire home. So one from uh, the safety standpoint of uh, dangerous gases that you may be inhaling and then also fire because we don't want fire in the house. That's bad, unless you're cooking and then that's a necessity. So moving on, this was phenomenal. I was so happy. I have been emailing back and forth with this customer um, for so long. And if you take a look at the very, very top, um, it says that, um, hey, we were able to knock off 17K, um, which is insane, $17,000 off the cost of the house because of the inspection we did. Do you know how much their inspection cost? Like, I think it was like 500 bucks. I don't know, something along those lines. Um, and we did, you know, radon. We Well, I guess so, $400 for the home inspection at the time, uh, 150 for radon. So 550 bucks, let's say. So we did $550 for these folks and we were able to save them $17,000, which is insane. Anyway, uh, we jumped back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And so then um, whenever they moved in, everything was great with their house, except that then they started to have a problem. So they asked us, hey, what do you think this problem is? And um, and then we boom, listed out all the things that we thought the problem might've been. And uh, whenever we talked to the heating guy, it was like, yeah, it turns out you're pretty close in your thoughts. And pretty close is most definitely accurate. I mean, we were spot on as far as what the issue may have been. So then why didn't the issue present itself on the day of the inspection? Well, because I wasn't taking a shower uh, on the day of the inspection. I wasn't running appliances and then taking a shower. I was just like, okay, the water is hot. The water is hot. The water is hot. We are good in each one of these locations. And so did we miss it? 
Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there was an issue and we missed it. Could it have not been an issue on that day? Maybe, but it seems like that was just degrading, degrading, degrading based on what the issues were. And it was just two systems that had ended up failing. Um, and so could it be brand new the next day? Yeah, sure, maybe. Or did we miss it? Yeah, sure, maybe. But the main thing is, is that one, I loved this customer. This We worked together on a couple of homes, uh, super amazing guy. We saved them a boatload of money, which is great. And then later they found an issue and they were like, hey, it's a house and it's to be expected. And whenever they reached out to us, we said, hey, here are the things to look at, listen through all of them. And I consider that really good customer service because whenever they got the professional there and the professional plumber said, yeah, it's these two issues, it was like, boom, spot on, amazing. Um, so just keep in mind that just because you get a home inspection, just because everything goes really, really well and you find all these issues, there's always gonna be another issue. And the next day, some other system might fail. And so just be always mindful of what we're able to do. And the reason I bring up this example is because we missed something. At least that's what it looks like. Because I don't think, I think it was like degrading. So we clearly must have missed it. But that's again, because we weren't taking like a half hour shower. So we didn't know that the water wasn't getting to like the right temperature to feel comfortable in the shower. So what I'm getting at is that we missed something, but we saved them $17,000 on other things. So whenever you get your inspection report, don't just say, oh my gosh, they missed this one thing. Take a look at the other things that we've got. Did we find 30 other things? Did we find 40 other things? Okay, cool, yeah. So 30 or 40 things and we missed one? As long as it's not a big one, I think we should be okay. But always reach out to us first. Say, hey, John, here's what you missed. What's going on? Oh, cool, well, oh, actually I looked at the 360 degree photos and it didn't even look like this at all on the day of the inspection. Or there was like this really big piece of furniture and um, and that wasn't there on the day of the, or that was there on the day of the inspection and now it's not there and that's why we're seeing this issue. So just always do your best to be understanding of the fact that we are human, just as you are human, and we don't always catch everything. But in this example, especially, my gosh, did we catch a lot. And my gosh, $17,000 for a $550 inspection? They got what they paid for, and that makes me really, really happy. I talked a lot, sorry. <laughs> so um, backsplash, steal it, and adequate. So let's talk about this for just a second. <sighs> Does it matter? No. So why is it in the report? Because it takes time. Okay, but does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. But <sighs> the way I look at it is, it's gonna take you time to either get grout put in there or to get caulking and put that on there. And yes, it's blue, so it really doesn't matter. It's just a basic little maintenance thing. But why do we put this stuff in here? We put this stuff in here because there's a right way to do things and a wrong way, and we want it to be the right way. And also, it just it's one of those things that's gonna take up time and it's gonna be a frustration. And if it's gonna take up time and be a frustration, I want you to be aware of the fact that it exists. I mean, come on, how much is it gonna cost for some caulking? Maybe a dollar? Maybe a dollar fifty? So put a dollar fifty worth of caulking on there. Great, problem solved. Okay, so why is it in the report? Because how much time did it take you to do that? Or did you hire somebody to do it? And that's a part of their punch list. It's just, it's important that even though it's a little thing for you to be aware of these little things, because we want your house to be functional and be the way it's supposed to be and be safe and be good. And so anyway, that's that. So let's talk about electrical service panels. This one here at Federal Pacific, I believe that we've covered this before in other, um, you know, season series, what uh, in like October and November. Um, but basically, whenever we come across Federal Pacific, we do not open them up at all. This is a stab lock uh, type or style. And basically, um, these are known for billions of dollars, or actually one, uh, every year, there we go, uh, $40 million in property damage every year because of these things. And so, yeah, the company doesn't exist anymore. And yeah, the, the all the money from the lawsuit has dried up and there's nothing left. But you know what is left? these service panels and these service panels need to be replaced. In the Summit County area, it's like two grand, um, but we got a quote from a guy in Denver for $800. So it's like, wow, depending on where you get your labor, uh, you can get this job done really inexpensively or for a lot of money. And so um, really though, two grand though, to prevent your house from burning down, like that's a good investment. Plus you can then put in AFCIs, GFCIs, all that kind of stuff. And then that way you're like even more extra protected. So moving down from there, um, this trip was inadequate um, and it was making an arcing noise. So whenever you go to trip it, it was making this like buzzing arcing noise and you don't want that, that's bad. Uh, so just get the GFCI receptacle replaced. It's a health safety thing. It costs $15. Watch a YouTube video on how to replace uh, an electrical outlet. Um, but my gosh, is there a lot to know? There's a lot to know about replacing electrical outlets. So maybe just hire a professional. And if you're buying this house, 
maybe just have an agreement with the seller. Hey, you're going to have an electrician come in and repair this. Boom, done, good to go. But then how do you know they did it? Well, that's the hard thing. So you could hire us to come back and then double check and run through that punch list. Um, and I, I do my best to be as politically correct as I can. But on this last punch list that I went through, I actually brought the builder aside, the, the person who built the house and said that they repaired all these things. I brought him aside and I said, hey, from one professional to another, you specifically stated that you repaired these things. I just walked through. You did not repair any of these things. I'm allowing you the opportunity to get in front of this. I have no obligation to tell you, the builder, about this, but I'm about to go tell my client that the majority of things that you said that you fixed, you did not fix. And so, uh, I'm not saying anything negative about anybody, but some people are really keen on trying to pull the wool over other people's eyes. And I get it. Having built stuff, sometimes you just get to the end of the project and you want to be done. And like, it's just all oh, these little petty things and these punch lists. And oh my gosh, like, I just want to be off of this site and on to the next site. I've had enough headaches here and I'm done. And so I get it. And I understand where that builder was coming from. And I understand the fatigue. <sighs> but you have a person that you said you did something. You must do what you say. You, just, you have to. It's just integrity 101. If you say to somebody that you're going to do something, you do it. If you say to somebody that you've done something, it better be done. That's all I got. I, that was a soapbox. I'm now stepping off of the soapbox. Um, and I'm done with that. But um, Either replace the GFCI yourself or have a builder do it for you. So moving on to the next thing, this one here, there used to be a washer and dryer here and this um, this drain pipe did not have what it needed to like um, to prevent sewer gases from going out. So two things, one is if there's no P-trap, then that sewer gas can come out. Thing number two is if that P-trap is not used regularly, um, then that P-trap um, will then dry out and then sewer gases are gonna come out anyway. So either add a little bit of water, depending on um, the P-trap, you can add some mineral oil into it. Um, they also have P-traps where in the bottom of the trap, the U-shaped part of the P-trap, so it looks like a letter P, U-shaped part of that, they'll have a, um, a little fitting that goes into it. So something that you use regularly, a small amount of that water is gonna flow into this P-trap and may actually overflow and you know go down the drain like it's supposed to, but a little bit of water goes into there to help keep that P-trap filled because not always do you want to put mineral oil in there because if you put mineral oil in there and then we have like an overflow situation, now you have mineral oil on everything and it's just a pain in the butt. So um, there's some interesting tech about keeping P-traps um, full of water. So moving on from there, okay, nothing's wrong right now, but just do the job right. That's all I got to say about that. So this connector is supposed to be underneath that metal plate and they did not do that. So what they need to do is take off that metal connector, uh, put it underneath the plate and then tighten it back up. The main reason why is that the only thing that is holding those um, 240 volts, more than likely 30 amps, you know, and it only takes 0.7 amps to kill a person. So anything above 0.7, and this is at probably 30 amps, um, can kill a person. And so right now it's not an issue, but just if it's predictable, it's preventable. So imagine that I pull on those wires and now those wires are no longer being held on with those little screws to just hold on the wire and they come out and they make contact with something and um, electrocute or hurt somebody in some way. Is it a problem? No. Is it nitpicky? Probably yes, uh, because who's gonna pull on that wire? But if it's predictable, it's preventable. Just install the fitting correctly. There's a reason that we have uh, a national electric code, NEC. There's a reason that, and I'm not a code inspector, there's a reason that things should be done a certain way, and that is to protect people. That's all there is to it. So uh, moving on, dishwashers. Man, dishwashers just love to leak. Interesting um, thing about houses is that they're building, they, who is they? There are builders that I am aware of that are building houses where they actually make the kitchen floor, you know, with tile or whatever, um, they build it exactly like they would a shower, which means that they they have a shower a shower pan, and that shower pan uh, will catch any water. So if your ice maker fails, if your water uh, disperser fill uh, fails, if the sink overflows, if your dishwasher fails, that water gets retained and goes directly to a floor drain, which is so cool. So floor drains in the kitchen floor drains in the laundry room, floor drains, um, you know, um, 
in the bathrooms, like if your kid overflows the uh, the bathtub or if the toilet backs up or whatever. How cool is that? You mop it into the floor drain, you run a little extra water and you're done. You haven't destroyed your floor, you haven't destroyed the ceiling that is below. Uh, like it's just a really good thing. Anyway, dishwashers leak, just be mindful. So next thing, this fence. We don't normally inspect fences. There's no reason to inspect fences. You know, you get a new fence, whatever. But this fence had a um, uh, mechanical open and close um, and whatever. It, it looked like it had been hit by so many vehicles. Uh, all the hinges were broken off. The metal was just standing there. And in fact, this house, um, I had done an inspection earlier in the summer and I saw this house and I saw, you know, uh, people partying at the house and whatever. And I'm on the roof of this other house. I'm like, wow, these people are getting a little rowdy during COVID, but I mean, you know, more power to them. Um, and I think that that's how these kind of things happen. Uh, sometimes whenever houses are used for rentals, they get used hard for rentals. So just something to be mindful of. And to repair this, you need a welder. There, there aren't any like off the shelf parts to fix this. This was custom welded. And so therefore you need a welder to repair it. So um, mouse droppings, don't like it. Hantavirus, don't like it. 40% chance of death, not a fan. Um, so anyway, if there's mouse poop, you know, just kill everything, let it settle, then clean it up. Give, give it time to make sure you don't catch a virus. Um, next thing. Okay, so there was a repair. All right, so there's a repair, big deal. Why, why do I care? Because your wall looks ugly, okay? Your wall, I, as a friend, I wanted to tell you that your wall looks ugly. And so because of this and this repair, um, it's gonna cost you time and it's gonna cost you money. And it's just, uh, you wanna know the difference between a good drywaller and a bad drywaller? Ability to match texture. If they can match texture where I can't see that there is a difference, oh my gosh, they, then they're pros and you wanna hire them for every job. Put them in your Rolodex. Nobody uses Rolodexes, but you know what I'm talking about. Put it in your contact list and then have them forever because somebody that can match textures, they are phenomenal. Anyway, have people do a good job. All right, this electrical receptacle, there was no weather protection, uh, and which is really funny because the snow, and it was very, very early December, um, the snow was already at the bottom of that. What do you think is gonna happen uh, during spring runoff. Also, these um, these uh, surge protectors uh, are surge GFCI. Sorry, these GFCI protected outlets um, were not tripping as quickly as they should. One of them was one uh, that was making that arcing noise, or one of these was making an arcing noise. Um, and so, I just don't trust them. I just don't trust them. And if the snow is going to go up high enough, and then the snow is going to melt, like no, 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 no. Not if people are walking out to the hot tub. We don't need that. We don't need that extra risk, that extra liability. If you're going to rent the place, pretty, pretty please. Just get that fixed, get that repaired. Um, dryer vents should not be filled up with lint. Not at all. Mm -mm -mm. So you want to make sure you're cleaning out your dryer vents because if that lint were to combust, then you now have a fire tube uh, that is burning down your house. So don't let that happen. Clean out your vents at least annually. That would be ideal if at all possible. So then we go into a sewer scope. Um, this one was uh, was interesting. So what we have here is just a sludge in the pipe, and this is not a bad pipe at all. So please, this is actually a very, very good pipe. Um, just We just want to put this in here just because, you know, sewer scoping is a thing. And a few other things that were found that were odd was that there was this weird, like, offset. Um, and it was just, they weren't fit together. And there was this offset, but it looked like there might've been a rubber gasket uh, holding them together. I don't know if I like that, um, but it was like right as it went underground. Um, so I understand why it was done that way. And like, there's nothing necessarily wrong, just, you know, uh, from the interior and the fact that it's buried, it didn't look great. However, nothing was really wrong. Um, and this, this pipe just had a couple little funny quirks about it. Um, so, you know, if you are going to buy a house and you know that the cost of like a sewer repair, if we had to dig up the ground or whatever, could be, you know, 10 grand easily. Because you think about the cost to rent the vehicle, removing the material, adding in new material whenever you're done, putting everything back, renting the compactor to compact the soil. It just, it gets expensive and it gets expensive quickly. So if you know that you're buying a house and it, you know that it goes to a public um, sewer system, please just get a sewer scope, get it done. Oh, but the HOA, the HOA will pay for it. Well, as stated before, you are the HOA, so you will be paying for it. And it'd be ideal to know, oh, there's going to be like a $20,000 charge or maybe a 40,000 or 60,000 because they have to dig up this entire parking lot. It's nice to know that before you buy the house and before you are then tied not tenant, but if you've seen the movie, very good. 
but tied in with that HOA, before that happens, wouldn't it be nice just to know that that's not going to happen, that that's not going to be an issue? Something to think about. Food for thought. So pretty, pretty please. They are so cool, so beautiful, so amazing. Do not build a deck around a tree, please. Pretty, pretty please. Now they said with a big enough lever, you can move the world. With a big enough lever, you can rip the deck off of your house. So this tree is just standing up like this. And every time that the wind blows, it moves over. And that top of the tree could be moving, I don't know, 10 feet back and forth. And then down at the base, it doesn't look like much. You're only moving half an inch. No big deal. Okay, no big deal. But as that tree grows, unless you are cutting out that deck, then what's going to happen is that, that tree um, is going to start ripping that deck and putting strain on that deck half an inch at the base all the time, repetitively. It's not good for your deck. Next thing is, why is that tree that close to your house? You do not want those roots going into your house. You do not want those roots going into your sewer line. This particular house, we did not do a sewer scope. I said that you might want to do a sewer scope. I really am hopeful that everything is okay. They had maybe 15, 20 trees from their house directly um, to the main road where their sewer line would have gone based on where the clean out was, based on um, the design of the house uh, and where everything drained down to uh, and, uh, and where the road was. And like, I feel so bad for the sewer line because the amount of roots that it is going to have to battle throughout its life. And this house was over 50 years old. I, ugh, trees near houses. I don't like it. Don't like it one bit. Mm -mm, ain't no way, ain't no how. All right. I think uh, I may have talked about a story where a dead bird fell on me from inside of a furnace. Um, the main thing is animals will go into these spaces, whether it be um, a bird or a chipmunk or a squirrel or a mouse, and they will get into your house and they will destroy your house, or they will get into your house and they will not be able to get out and they will die. And that's not nice. So just put a cover on these vents so that way uh, the wildlife can stay protected, your house can stay protected. Easy stuff. All right, this house had some foundation uh, cracks. Now, on the outside, it didn't really look all that bad. Um, and it wasn't really that much of a concern. I think I have photos of it. Here we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But on the inside, there was just a lot of things I didn't like. And um, and is it bad? No, not really. I think all they need to do is some repointing um, because it's just minor little things. Also, we want to make sure the outside air, you can see all that bright light in the upper right hand corner there. We don't want that to be, you know, coming into the house. And so basically um, where we are is that it looked like they had cut out a section um, and put in a support beam and they just never fixed it properly. And I think they, I don't know, they just, they, they went a little overboard. Overall, the house seemed just fine and I'm sure everything is just fine. However, that's not my area of expertise. And I just, aside from just needing to repoint it, like uh, putting new mortar into the joints, that's thing number one. Um, but I, I would want maybe somebody else just to take a look at it, just to make sure that we are 100%. Because it was just in that one corner. And so does that mean that only that one corner is settling? Or does that mean just that one corner um, they made modifications to? I don't have the answer to that. So um, these balusters. So these balusters were like, 10 inches wide or something along those lines. Let's see if it, if I say what it was. Uh, no, um, but the picture would have it, just the picture slightly cut off. So yeah, 10 inches wide. Babies, okay, so I put myself in the mindset of if I was myself at 90 years old, if I was myself at six years old, and if I was myself um, you know, as a raindrop, maybe even myself as two years old, as an infant that can crawl, um, really, really unsafe. And so they you know, just add more balusters. You don't want it to be more than four inches. You can make things safer, not that hard to do. So. Um, next thing, filter, poor placement. Um, you can see where those blue arrows are pointing that that is what the, the tray should um, slide into or what the that is the tray that the filter should be sliding into. And with that being said, um, where it is now, it is not adequately protecting the furnace from dust. Um, a lot of people think, oh, okay, well, I'm gonna buy this super amazing filter. It's gonna be a HEPA filter. It's gonna clean up the air and oh, I'm gonna breathe so well. You're not wrong, it would do that, except that your furnace is not designed to have that many air exchanges per hour um, to make that actually relevant. Your furnace can heat up your house, but your furnace cannot suck all the air out of your house, run it through a filter, and give you all the air back enough times in an hour for it to be worth your money. So 
I'm not saying that you shouldn't buy those HEPA filters, but you could save a lot of money by not buying them. So something to think about. Uh, again, garage door separation. So yep, just a door that does not close that should be closing. We already talked about one of those before. We take a look here, uh, wire management. So to be frank, these folks did a great job. Really, really good job. Unfortunately, because of the design of that structure, they were unable to get the wires the last little bit of the way uh, un undiscovered, I guess, um, just you know through the walls. If they would have gone up through the attic, there was plenty of space through the attic where they could have run all of these wires up through the attic. Of course, the longer the wire run, you lose kind of the high end whenever you're talking about your speakers. So less than ideal. But other things that can be done, wireless technology is phenomenal. You can do wireless uh, subwoofers, wireless regular speakers. Um, there's so much that can be done and you don't necessarily need to have these cables. Okay, well, but I need a cable for the television. Sure, you can do HDMI wireless. So you can have the audio and the video signal, the digital signal wirelessly transferred from the receiver to the television. So all of that can be done without wires. You don't necessarily have to do this. It's slightly archaic, um, but man, did they do a really, really good job uh, doing the wiring that they did, except that right there in the dining room, it's ugly. It's real ugly right there in the dining room. Such is life. So uh, moving on. Up in that attic, same attic, um, there was a vent um, that just needs a little bit of tape. Um, easy, easy, easy fix. Super easy fix. However, if you don't fix it, mold uh, is like just, it's a thing that's going to happen. You really don't want to vent your hot, humid air from your shower into the attic space. Bad idea. Don't want to do it. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and we're going to tape that so that way we don't have any issues whatsoever. Moving on, um, this faucet. So there's a copper pipe that comes out. And then basically you have the um, the fill spout goes over top of that pipe. And you can see that in the picture is the white. And the water is supposed to just go out and down the fill spout. Unfortunately, it was not connected correctly. And it was, instead of just going here and then out, it was going here, stopping, pushing back up against the wall and then draining out in the wall. And it could be in the wall, it could be on the wall, it could be anywhere. And so we just wanna get that fixed. It's an easy fix. Uh, any plumber can get that done. You could probably get it done as well. Um, watch a YouTube video, very, very easy to replace. A um, few things you might wanna keep in mind though, uh, whenever you're replacing it, because um, threading and other things, lengths, lots of things could go wrong or require you to have extra special skills. But in general, um, have a plumber fix that. That's just the easiest thing, especially if you're buying the house. Just tell them, hey, it leaks. I, as a condition of buying the house, just get a plumber to fix this. Just tell them how easy of a thing it is to do and then they can pay for the plumber. <laughs> so anyway, um, this particular structure, uh, not safe at all. Not a fan, not at all a fan. Um, and so a lot, a lot goes on here, but basically what they did was they built a roof and they supported it with two by fours. Uh, snow loads where we are. And I think this was in Leadville. Um, so lots of snow. Um, you're above 10,000 feet, well above, maybe 11,000. I don't remember what Leadville is. It might be 11,000. Um, but you're at 11,000 feet, high alpine environment. Not only do you have the snow load pushing down, but you also have wind lifting up in that upheaval. Um, those two by fours and the way they were attached, not good. Also, they have all that weight of the roof coming down onto a railing, coming down onto a couple little balusters, coming onto the bottom rung where the balusters connect to, and the spans were just way off. Anyway, ugh. Um, not a good idea, not safe, um, just not ideal. And then a lot of things are falling apart. Um, the vertical posts made of um, four by fours, um, I think they were using salt and the salt had broken down um, the metal and basically corroded the metal. So that way the, the bottom thing was just like moving around and there were three that were no longer attached to the ground and were just, you could just knock them back and forth. So what was holding the deck in place? Nothing good, that's for sure. Um, so things like that. So this one here is a cold joint. Um, so a cold joint, what is that all about? So basically, uh, I think what happened is that they ran out of concrete uh, for their pour and then they had to wait for the next concrete truck. And you can see two things happen. One is you can see that cold joint. That is the, the flat line underneath all those exposed rocks, the exposed aggregate. There's that flat line. And that's because that's probably where they stopped pouring. And then the new pour, they poured it in, but they had air bubbles. And that's why you can see that exposed aggregate because they didn't use a vibrator that you push down and it just vibrates um, all of the air bubbles out. Or they didn't take a stick and you're supposed to just with a stick 
get rid of all those air bubbles. They didn't do an adequate job and we had a cold joint. Ugh, not ideal, but this house had been around for so long, no issues, no other cracks, no nothing. This is just something to be like, hey, just so you know, the foundation wasn't really poured well, but I don't see any other issues with the foundation. So I guess we're all good. And really the test of time, if this was a brand new house, I'd be like, hey, this is something you might wanna be worried about. Probably call the builder back, see what can be done. This house here being what, 60 years old? If something bad was gonna happen, it was gonna happen in the last 59 years and it didn't. So should be fine. Um, moving on, uh, what we have, exp people just want to kill me. I don't know what it is about me, but they just want me dead. Um, they had wires hanging from the ceiling, uh, hanging out of these junction boxes, um, that were just live. And like, it, you could just touch the tips of the wires and they were hanging down at shoulder height. They were, uh, right there where the switches are. They, it was so unsafe. Anyway, electrical tape, very, very handy, uh, made as many of them safe as I could just Finish the job. If you're gonna do it, finish the job. If you're gonna start the job, finish the job. Uh, that's all there is to it. Uh, this burning assembly, uh, burner assembly was just so dirty. Uh, you, can, you Actually, uh, underneath the burner assembly is where the number plate is that tells you the serial number, model, all that. Can't see it. You can't see it at all. You, like I was like, well, where is it? It should be like right here. And then I'm like, all right, so take the hand. And there was like a quarter inch worth of dust underneath there. And that is just so bad for a furnace. Like that, that will kill the furnace. Plus it's combustible, so that's less than ideal. But um, you just need to get it cleaned. That's all I need to do. Nothing else is wrong with this furnace, it just needs cleaned. So then in here, uh, this is actually for the same furnace. This is a combustible air vent. Um, and so basically they had put insulation in the top of it, probably because they were getting cold air drafting down from the attic. That's the idea. Um, because if you do not get that cold air and in order the fire triangle, and we had talked about the poly, uh, fire polygon, um, basically you have your fuel source, you have your heat, and then you have air. And we need air in order for that to work. If it cannot get air, you know what's gonna happen? It's gonna do what's called a backdraft. In order to get the air, it's gonna pull it from basically the chimney or the flue, and it's gonna pull that all the way down. And then, okay, so just pull all that down. So where does all of the um, combustible gas go? All that carbon monoxide. Oh, it just goes in your house and kills your whole family. No big deal. So all that has to happen here is we remove that piece of insulation. We just whoop, take it, gone, good to go. If we don't do that, what's the risk? Our whole family could die because of a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas that will kill you. Like, am I being too negative? I don't know. Write in the comments. Let me know if I'm too negative. But the reality is just remove that piece. If it's uncomfortable, then it's uncomfortable. But you, yeah, God, your family is the most important thing in the world. Just take care of your family. And this, you know, is... Maybe it was an accident. Maybe it was ignorance. Maybe they didn't know what the point of that pipe was. But it is so important that we get fresh combustible air into those spaces that burn um, that burn fuel, such as natural gas or propane. If not, the risk of carbon monoxide is just so high. And pretty, pretty please, double check your carbon monoxide detectors. Pretty please, double check your smoke detectors. Do the things you need to do to protect your family. That's, that's all I have to say about that. So um, this house here uh, was a modular home and it was put in two pieces put together. And that's great that two pieces were put together, except there was space. There was space between those two pieces. Now that's really, really good for hornets, really good for other types of insects. And all we wanna do is just clear it up. And, and mice got in here or chipmunks or something. You won't believe what they can fit through. Um, so anyway, just something to be mindful of. Uh, go up into that attic. And technically, if you wanted, you could put in a gable vent. I don't mind the air is moving in and out. In fact, that's ideal, but we want to control what else is moving in and out with that air. And in this case, we have pests that are moving in and out and we just don't wanna have that. All right, this, uh, this house here, I, I sometimes joke with my wife and I'm like, okay, honey, can you pick out you know, what the safety issue is? And, uh, and uh, she <laughs> jokingly said, yeah, you could just yeet yourself right off of these stairs. And if you're unfamiliar with the term, um, basically means to throw, throw oneself with vigor, I guess would be the best way to put it. Um, and what, what we mean by this is that these stairs, there's a center column and this center column did not extend up high enough. And so just uh, the picture right now doesn't do it justice, but you literally, it, it was half of a shoulder's width and you could just walk straight off of these stairs. It was crazy. Um, and then they had this other section um, that they put up a piece of, um, you know, oh man, what, what's the technical name for it? Anyway, just a, a little piece of like one by half, uh, you know, to stop somebody from like walking out onto this, you know, balcony, I guess. And um, wow, 
uh, if, if you were a toddler, if, if you were below the age of 10, you could walk right underneath it without even having to get on your hands and knees uh, and then fall from the top. And so again, the main thing is, if it's predictable, it's preventable. Do the things that are needed to protect you and your family to make sure people don't fall down an already dangerous spiral staircase. Because if you fall into the middle, you basically fall two flights is, is what happens. Because you're up here, here's the middle, and we have a gradual down. But if I can go past the middle, then I have basically just fallen down half of the height of that um, staircase, which is extremely dangerous. That's so dangerous. Anyway. Um, funny little things like that. So don't eat yourself off of a uh, off of a stair set. Very very dangerous. All right. Uh, yeah. Great. Here here's here's the other picture of that uh, little one by half uh, right there. This is what it should be uh, drawn in red. This is what it is currently. Just very very not safe. Um, and then here is that other picture of that staircase. Um, and that vertical uh, lines, those vertical lines are basically what should have been projected up higher um, to make sure that you are safe and protected. Uh, and that you don't fall down those stairs to the interior because that center column is there to protect you. It's not just to hold the stairs, it's for protection as well. And so basically until that gets to shoulder height, you are unprotected and can fall into the stair set and therefore fall down because there's nothing graspable for you to grab before you tumble the rest of the way down. Little things, little things about life. Oh, here's another, here's another attempted murder. Um, so basically, this uh, this particular house is set on a solar uh, power array and is completely off grid. So with this being off grid, um, to make the power a little bit more consistent in different places that are high load, they have capacitors that were put into um, the panel, and these capacitors are super high discharge. Uh, you can look this one up online. Uh, and it's it's enough to kill you. Is is all all I need to tell you about that. Um, but basically. Uh, what happens with this is that if this were to tilt over, tip over, and there was enough wire to let it do just, I mean, you could you could dangle it, throw it halfway around the room and not unplug it and put it right back in, you know, because there was so much excess wire um, and it should be properly secured. So if we take a look here uh, and another service panel inside the exact same house, you can see they were properly strapped and secured in there. So that way they can't make contact with these electrodes that are at the top because if they make contact, it is not going to be okay. You could you could pretty much weld two pieces of metal together with this. That's the amount of electrical discharge. It's insane. So anyway, stop trying to kill your inspector. Next thing, um, the gas was uncapped in an abandoned termination. So basically, they had shut off the valve, and that's great. Thank you for shutting off the valve because you did nothing else to protect this house or your family. Um, basically, we want to cap it. Now that cap is going to make it so that way the gas cannot leak out. Um, so that's helpful in a lot of different ways. But the main thing is, is if somebody opens or bumps that valve, um, then there is no way for gas to come into the house because believe it or not, combustible gas is combustible. So we just don't want that to happen. Um, moving down, hot tubs, golly gee. All right, if you're gonna have a hot tub, you gotta keep it turned on. They physically not only turned off the switch, but they also turned off the breaker. Not like the breaker tripped, they physically turned off the breaker and turned off the switch. And now this is what our hot tub looks like. This is very appropriate for the area that we're in. Um, but what, what you need to know about this hot tub is that this hot tub is done. There is nothing more that can be done with this hot tub. Um, so let's say at the tub, the tub is more than likely cracked. All that expansion, the tub is cracked. Okay, let's say the tub isn't cracked. Okay, each and every single little jet is now cracked. And the fitting that puts the jet onto um, onto the tub is cracked. And you say, oh, that's the, no, -uh. okay, well, let's just work this out. The thermal load of that, of that um, water that's in there will not freeze as quickly as the, the water inside the pipes. The water inside the pipes are, is gonna freeze a lot faster. So now all the water in the pipe has frozen before the center of that hot tub has frozen. And now because of that, let's say that those 90 degree elbows held strong. And let's say all those fittings held strong. Well, now, ice has pushed out into the center of the tub, but the center of the tub is not done freezing yet. So the center of the tub is going to freeze and push that ice back, which is then what's the weakest point? The point where the jet makes contact with the tub and it's just gonna pop back because it will allow itself to pop backwards. So every single one of those, um, every single one of those jets, every single one of those pipes, the pump, everything is done. The, there, is, there is no way to cost effectively repair this. This hot tub is just completely done. So um, moving on, 
This right here was a limited inspection of this house. Um, and here's the synopsis on that limited inspection. Um, but basically I had a guy give me a call and he's like, hey, I have mold. Ugh. Okay, well, we don't do mold inspections, but I can find out where the moisture is coming from. And so I explained all these things and gave him a whole bunch of stuff. And he's like, listen, nobody responds to emails. You responded and gave me every piece of information that I could possibly need. You're hired. And I'm like, are you sure? Because like, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to help you out. But I went in, did the, did the task, um, went into the attic space, took a look at everything, uh, thermal camera, the works. And um, my only my only real explanation was because it had an in-floor radiant heat, there was no air movement. And I believe that based off of the person that was living in that room before, that they were running a humidifier nonstop, 24 seven. So we're increasing the humidity in those areas. And then the mold was mostly growing on those um, uh, ceiling joists. And those ceiling joists, um, we're getting mold because it was a different temperature. And so that difference of temperature kind of created like a dew point, we'll consider that, uh, on the ceiling, which is why we got mold in those areas. And what's interesting is that whenever I talk to the homeowner, they're like, yeah, 100%, that person, I believe, had a, a humidifier on all the time. And so if you left the door closed and that was completely different humidity and it was much higher humidity, that explains the mold growth because everything else on the inside of the attic looked amazing. Um, so. Yeah, limited inspection strikes again, and I believe gave a good enough uh, explanation. So then what's the remedy? Um, paint the walls with kills, that's K-I-L-Z, um, which basically will stop that mold growth and kind of seal it in there. Um, and then uh, repaint with whatever you want, because kills is like a primer. Um, and already with the moisture meter and everything, there was no elevated levels of moisture. That person had moved out, you know, uh, um, months and months and months ago. And so because of that, everything was like dried out. They just said, hey, listen, it hasn't seemed to have gotten worse but I don't know why it happened in the first place. And that's what we were able to diagnose. So interesting, very, very interesting. And uh, that was fun to do. So uh, next, electrical service drop. If you can touch it, you can die. And that's why it's in red. And so we wanna make sure that over walkways, this is at least 10 feet. This was, this was maybe chin level. It wasn't even eye level, it was chin level. Um, so unsafe. And the utility company knows that it's unsafe and they should be able to come out and, and get that taken care of or have an electrician come out and get it taken care of. Um, because right there, I'm, oh gosh, it was just not, not great. Okay, but I mean, like, let's be real. This house was 140 years old. Wow, 140 years old. And uh, and for, for the age, it was it was very, very good. Uh, and yeah, so anyway, here, here's another picture of just, you know, what, what we had going on. Um, just really not, not ideal, not safe. Um, so we had a laundry leak, and I don't know if this was coming from the laundry machine or if this was coming from the water supplies or what the deal was, um, but basically um, the water was leaking and you could see it on the floor, but as soon as you stepped on it, it's just sopping wet. So what's that dry spot? That's the crawl space. And so all the water was falling down before going into the crawl space. Um, dang. Anyway, that's uh, it's gonna be a very moldy, yucky mess. And those um, washing machines were very old and just ugh, not, not ideal. Um, so then uh, the heating here. So um, two things was, and I put these two together um, because it was basically that um, the heating, the heater was past the design life. Um, so it's 41 years old, which is pretty old. The next thing is, is that we had an LED that was indicating that it was in a, in a retry state. In the time that I was down in that crawl space, it had tried four times to ignite. And it's not just that it tries four times. So it's not like try, stop, try, stop, try, stop. No, it's like a whole purging thing. And so it was like, maybe 20 to 30 minutes um, where it would try, 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 try. Nothing would happen. It would allow five minutes to go by to purge any gases that were expelled. And then it'd try, 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 try. And then it would let five minutes go by and it kept doing this. And finally it, it, it like lit, but um, yeah, there, there were just other indications that it was not in good shape. So things to be mindful of. So as we move down, um, this one here, uh, as soon as I flushed the toilet, I saw water coming out from underneath. Not good. I'll explain why in a second. Whenever I flushed the toilet a second time, more water came out and I'm like, ugh, also not good. Um, so what that is is the wax ring. So you have your toilet, the pipe comes down from the toilet, uh, goes to a wax ring, and then it goes down to the rest of your drainage. Now that means that something is wrong with that wax ring. Uh, the toilet was solid on the ground, so it's not like there was movement there, but the main thing to keep in mind, oh golly, here's why it's a problem. You have the tile on the floor. You have the subfloor, you have the floor joists, you have insulation between units, and then you have somebody's ceiling. And you're telling me <laughs> that that water comes out right onto the tile? 
and it doesn't affect the subfloor, and it doesn't affect the joists, and it doesn't affect the uh, insulation, and it doesn't affect the ceiling, there's no way. That is gonna be an expensive, expensive repair. And here's the other thing. What gets flushed down your toilet? Got the answer? Not good stuff. Not good stuff down your toilet. Which means that now we have a biohazard issue where all that wood isn't just saturated with water and creating mold, it's also saturated with human feces uh, and just other bodily things that just should not be absorbing into the house. Which means uh, to fix it, you're cutting out a lot more. A lot more. And so that is just... Um, not a great thing. All right, next thing, baseboards, damaged, always. And kids just love to bend over those little heat sinks, those little fins. And the, uh, the thing is that it creates a convection current where basically the hot air goes up, the cold air goes down. If I heat it up some air, it goes up. And then since I have more hot air, now the cold air has to come over. And now we have a convection current. And that convection current um, basically is what heats up that house. And so um, two things. One is that this was a pull-out couch. And so the air couldn't really come underneath the couch to then create that convection current. So less efficiency there. That's that's step number one. Step number two, all those fins were damaged and broken and exposed and, and there was no uh, case to allow that to do what it needs to do. So uh, really less than ideal, um, might have to replace the entire section. All right, next thing, square D. So square D, if you see that your uh, resets on your square D uh, for those AFCI breakers are blue, then get an electrician. So all that they have to do is just pull out that circuit breaker, look at the bottom, and then put it back in. Once you look at the bottom, then you know. Um, so I had a link um, that you can click on. You can click on that link, and then it takes you to know exactly what happened um, directly from Square D, what the remedy is, which models were uh, affected, because not every model uh, was affected. It was only between March and September of 2004. So it's very possible that that could be perfectly fine. Okay, but you put it in red, John. Oh, I sure did. Because if it's not fine, then we have an issue. If it is fine, great. But if it's not fine, then we have an issue. And I'm not gonna say, oh, just don't worry about it. No, worry about it, have somebody check it. And once it's okay, it's good to go. Don't worry about it ever again. So um, next thing, uh, shower glass door at risk. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's just talk about this for a second. You get out of a shower, you're soaking wet. All you want is a towel. You're cold. There's a breeze. Why is there a breeze? I don't know, but it doesn't feel good. So you want to get to your towel. So what do you do? You open up the door. You're, the door has now just blocked you from getting this towel. So now you have to step to the side, close the door, and then you can get your towel. It's not a good solution. Secondarily, you can see that the glass is touching right up against that piece of metal. If I open that door too quickly, uh, or if I push on the door, that whole door will just shatter into a million pieces because it's tempered. Um, and so... We just don't want to damage the door. Get rid of that towel rack. It's not helping anybody and put it in a more appropriate place that whenever you exit the shower, you can get directly to your towel. Something to think about. Anyway, I got a little, I got a little heated on that one. I don't know. I don't have any skin on the game, uh, skin in the game on that one, but it is what it is. So um, heating, ice forming under house and exhaust. Yeah. So um, take a look at these pictures right here. Um, so coming out of um, that exhaust pipe for the high efficiency boiler, um, it was creating condensation. That condensation was dripping. That condensation then dripped uh, and created a basically an ice dam up against the house, which then went all the way up the wall, which is now you can see water physically pouring into the house, um, which is bad. That's not good. Um, so easy fix. Um, you just extend that out a little bit further so that way it doesn't um, drip onto the house. Um, and that should resolve that issue. But the main thing is... Um, you just don't want water coming through your walls. The drywall was completely saturated, uh, just a sponge, soaking wet, uh, less than ideal. Okay, radon mitigation specialists. Your title has the word specialist after the fact. Look at what you just did. Look at what you just did. You took all that radon and you expelled it directly back into the house. Directly back, in why, why? So looking at this, your, your fan, your vent fan, is rated that you can pour as much water down that pipe as you want. So are you protecting it from water? Because you don't need to. So what are you doing? Because all of that radon is coming right out of that opening and going directly back into the house in the soffit. Okay, I get what you're saying. Radon goes up. And so since radon is lighter than air, 
then it should be a non-issue and it's just it'll just be in the attic and then be expelled you know through the ridge vent okay D look at the research on ridge vents and how inefficient they are um turbine um vents are the only actual real efficient vent um you can get away with some of just the like little standard like little turtle looking things that you put on your uh roof ridge vents are not that efficient um and so you're just putting stuff back into the house for no good reason um just extend that up a little bit further and out and then if you say oh no that's that's incorrect it is correct because we did a radon test on this house and this has nothing to do with the radon going back into the attic space but you are a radon mitigation specialist. And this particular house was at a 7.7 .7 pictocuries per liter. Anything above a four is at the EPA action level. Anything above a four is at the EPA action level and needs to be mitigated. While this system was on and running and had been running, we were at a 7.7 .7 peaking at 15. You should be below a two if you have a radon mitigation system installed. So what are we doing here, radon mitigation specialist? Just asking. I'm just a lowly home inspector, but golly gee willikers and goshish galoshes, if you're gonna take care of a person, take care of them. That's all I gotta say about that. Man, I'm, I'm on a roll today, I'm getting heated. Um, so same thing, uh, pH concentrate neutralizer not present. We already talked about this once before. Just get it put in there, good to go. 30, 40 bucks, no big deal. Um, this fireplace was interesting. Inside the firebox, uh, you can see where those two orange arrows are. There's actually a gap in the bricks. Now, if you know anything about heat, heat will escape through the gaps in the bricks. And if you know anything about heat, heat can catch things on fire. And inside that firebox, we effectively have a place for heat to go into the walls to then catch your walls on fire. Pretty, pretty please. Get this kind of stuff looked at, corrected, whatever. Um, it was not put in as red because this fireplace had been in use all season long. And although the house is not yet caught on fire, it's, it's, if done correctly, you may never have to ever worry about this. But if you have a fire that is too large and, and you close the glass doors, there is the potential for fire risk. Maybe it should have been red, maybe red just to be a little bit more uh, alarming. Okay, this, this house had some interesting things. There's, there's a lot going on here, just a lot. Let's, um, let's focus on what was going on in the first place. In the first place, they had a well and the well had failed and they just recently got a new well replaced. Now, instead of replacing different things, um, you know, like their whole water storage tank and just putting an expansion tank in and so on and so forth, they left all the systems as is, um, which is fine. But my goodness, did this put us uh, for a loop? The water quality was fine. The water flow was fine. We were able to test everything it needed tested, but then they had bottles of drinking water inside the house and they uh, were turning off the breaker, going to the exterior of the house to turn off a breaker to turn off their well. And from talking to the realtors, it sounds like this is out of a concern because of the old system that they had, because they were at one point trucking in water because the well had failed. Um, and so I understand the, the reservations and fear, um, having had issues with water just because of how important water is. Um, but that's I just more had to be looked into and all of the, the, all of those facts kind of had to be given. Um, and that's why, you know, it was read and that's why there was so much, because if something was actually wrong with the well and the seller was turning off the breaker because something was wrong with the system, that's something that they need to be aware of. So being aware that the breaker was being shut off is very much a necessity. All right, people stop painting things. I know you love paint, but stop. To stop painting things. So effectively now, what could have been done pretty easily by just taking off that cover plate, which you would still be very safe if you were painting, just don't put anything in there. You could take off the cover plate, paint everything and put the cover plate back on. But instead they took brush strokes over top of these outlets and switches. And the problem with that is that because they took brush strokes and you can even see on, on one of these pictures, they had a label for what the switches did, painted right over it. Golly, Gosh darn it, you know, like, huh. So the problem now, if you got a little bit of paint on um, on the cover, a dollar, you just spent a dollar to get a new cover. Well, now a dollar for a new cover, then you're talking $3 for a new receptacle or however much for these dimmable switches that they have. And then you have to hire an electrician because you more than likely should not be the one um, to be installing this um, in that way. Um, so, you know, just 
<sighs> just be mindful of paint. And if, if you were a professional painter and you painted this person's house, shame on you. 100% shame on you. And is this a big deal? No, but you, now you can't use these things and the dimmer wasn't working because it was getting stuck on paint. Just little things like that. Just really, oh, mm, they get me. So um, chimney, crown damage minor. So basically um, you can do this, a crown of a chimney uh, with just regular, you know, like mortar or with concrete. If you do concrete, it's more expensive because you have to build a form, get the concrete up there, pour the concrete in there. Uh, then a couple days come back, remove the form, you're good to go. Concrete's amazing. Uh, mortar, not so much. Um, so we just wanna do a little bit of touch up, make sure things are good to go. And it looks like the, the chimney has been uh, decommissioned and is now just uh, thankfully has a metal sleeve uh, inserted into it because if it was a clay lined chimney, uh, it would be very unsafe. Um, so it's good to see that, that they did a little bit extra there. Um, so this right here, wiring exposed. Okay, yeah, it's six feet up in the air. I get it, okay, you're 100% right. Um, but it's exposed, so don't let that happen. And it was also right in front of the sink. Could you imagine blow drying your hair? One of your wet hairs, just, just one, one little wet hair just goes back and, and touches that electrical conductor. And because your feet are wet, the carpet is wet. Um, carpet, that's another thing. Anyway, because your feet are wet, uh, the carpet is wet, your hair is wet, and as you're blow drying, you just blew a hair directly into um, those you know, live conductive wires, you just electrocuted yourself. And the difference between electrocution and shock uh, is that you can't tell anybody you've been electrocuted, but you can tell people you've been shocked. So how much does it cost to put a cover on there? And if you can't find a cover, what, what do a couple pieces of electrical tape cost versus the risk? And is that unrealistic? Yes, it's very unrealistic that that would happen, but just do it, just cover it. What if there's like a, a fly and you're hitting it with fly swatter, or you take a broom and whatever, just, I don't know if it's predictable, it's preventable. Just take care of business. That's all you gotta do. Another uh, dishwasher that was leaking. Sometimes this happens because it fills up with so much water because um, inside your garbage disposal is where a lot of people connect, but there's actually uh, a plug that's in there and that plug either needs to be hammered this direction or with uh, pliers pulled out that direction uh, and then you attach stuff. Without removing that plug on your garbage disposal, then water can't actually go through there and then it's just gonna back up and you're gonna have issue after issue after issue. So maybe that's what's going on. Maybe things are clogged in another way. Maybe the pump isn't working the way it's supposed to. Uh, the moral of the story is there's water on the floor and there shouldn't be. So uh, moving on, this particular baseboard uh, heater, interesting, if you take a look at it, um, just the way that all the paint is cracked, I'm pretty sure that this is getting too hot. I wasn't able to get it too hot with the thermal camera, um, but I'm pretty sure that it's getting just a little bit too hot and it's causing some issues. And uh, we just, we wanna be mindful um, of that and don't put anything too close to it. So how do you know if it's too hot? Well, um, turn on all the other ones, let them let them be on for a half hour and then take a, a temperature gauge, whether it be one of those little infrared, whatever, uh, a, a thermal camera like what we use uh, or you know anything that you're able to, without electrocuting yourself, see what the temperature is. Um, and if it's above a certain level, comparatively speaking to the other units, it's probably too hot. It doesn't matter if it is an exact, you know, like, oh, well, we were at 200 degrees. Okay, that's fine. Um, I was at 400 degrees, that's really bad. Um, so, but if all of your other units are, let's say 120 degrees, 120 degrees, 120 degrees, and this one's at 180, just a little food for thought. So these windows um, were the, the seal in between the two window panes for that thermal barrier. Uh, were broken, which is why you can see that moisture that has built up in there. Additionally, the locks were not working as intended, um, so there were no longer any locks in there, and just, you know, just issues like that, just old age type things. So this carpet um, was nasty. Uh, there, They were basically black lines, and you can see in some of these black lines where people were walking, and ugh, less than ideal. All that carpet needs replaced, for sure. In that exact same uh, apartment, the grease stains on the ceiling were excessive. And now there's always some aerosolization of grease, which is why even if you just have like a microwave over top of your range, it sucks that air in, puts it through a metal mesh, which takes that aerosolized grease, uh, tries to catch it before it gets sent back out. Without that, you can run into things like this, especially if you cook very oily foods. Um, 
Soap and water? Yes, that, that'll do the trick. But who has to pay for that soap and water as far as time is concerned? Like it's gonna take a lot of time and everything was sticky and gross and ugh. And um, this was actually Shay's home inspection and he gave me a call and he's like, John, you're gonna have to take a look at this. And I've never seen a house that gross. I mean, like we've been in some gross houses, um, but this particular house um, definitely takes the cake as far as the, the grossest kitchen um, for sure. Um, this door here. Uh, so um, the door would bump up against the wall, lock the lock, and then the door was um, hung in such a way that the door wants to either smack up against the wall or latch completely closed. And that's just the way the door was. And uh, so this was again, Shay's home inspection and uh, he got locked out of the room. And thanks to his ingenuity, um, the, the thing that holds the tape um, our electrical tape and stickers and stuff. Um, the thing that held that tape uh, is actually what he used um, to open up the door. And I'm like, wow, I don't know if I would have thought of that, but like, you know how you have to press the little pin thing to open the door? And he was like, yeah, I think this might fit, did it. It was amazing. Uh, and he told me the story and I was like, that is, that's some good ingenuity. Um, so sinks, uh, if the sink is broken, um, that's bad. You don't want that to happen. Uh, and like, it looks like, Maybe some repairs were tried to be made or were, were attempted. And also looking underneath, they use like a flex seal. I mean, the commercials are amazing, don't get me wrong, but they use flex seal to fix this drain. That's not the way it's supposed to be done. Just do it correctly. That's all you need to do. And then that way it's serviceable in the future. The main thing is serviceability. If there is a P-trap, you want it to be serviceable. And so just um, some, something to keep in mind, something to think about. Um, so then this one here, Again, folks, with the paint, um, we, well, Shay really wanted to get into this particular service panel. It was front and center, nothing able to cover it. Um, and the way that the door opened um, for, the, um, for the refrigerator, nothing could have been placed in front of it. And what they did was they painted the service panel. You see, it's normally that gray color. Well, they painted it. And the problem with that is that it was painted so much that even by taking a razor blade and cutting around the box and then cutting around each one of the little um, screws, there was really no way to guarantee that it would still look good. And because it was such a central focal point, we ended up not opening up this, um, uh, this service panel. And you can see Shay wrote in there, the inspector took off the cover plate of an electrical receptacle in the kitchen and confirmed that the wiring was copper and safe for the home. And like, that's great. And that's what we want to do, but that's only one wire. I want to see every wire. I want to know what's coming into that house, what's going out of that house. And I want to know how they wired it. Did they do a good job or do they not? But whenever people paint these things shut, I don't want to go into a person's house and damage it on purpose. And in order to open that, I would purposely be damaging the house. And that is, that's not our game. That's not what we're all about. Everything else looked good. Everything else looked safe. There were no other red flags with electrical. So we're good to go. But um, just get that cover plate replaced. You can, you can take, cut around the edge, remove the cover plate, put on a replacement cover plate. And I know the gray is drab and just, uh, you know, it's just so 2020, but the reality is you really want that to look uh, as good as possible. The last thing is also about paint. And so this shower paint uh, is cracking. And the reason why, and Shade did an amazing job of, of writing this up, is that it is using an eggshell paint as opposed to a gloss or a semi-gloss. And so that eggshell is not as good whenever there's high moisture of uh, being able to wick away that moisture. And so uh, what he came up with is that it appears as if because of high moisture content inside of that um, shower room or the bathroom, I should say, um, that the, the wall was absorbing a little bit of that water and then peeling, cracking and having issues. If you put up a gloss or semi-gloss, that would definitely resolve um, a lot of those issues because then it will be a lot more resistant um, to the moisture and the dew that kind of uh, settles onto those walls. So um, in a nutshell, I guess uh, I guess we're done. And this has been the December 2020 in-service training. The main thing is, um, that we just always wanna make sure that whenever our inspectors find something that we are educating each other, all of our uh, inspectors are all learning the same thing. Uh, and that's real life, on the job, whatever, in addition to continuing education, in addition to everything else that we do on our, on our free time, like me watching building videos for fun, constantly, nonstop. To, to my own you know detriment. <laughs> uh, I, I'm very much into building sciences. Uh, all of my inspectors are, and these trainings just really do give us a good opportunity. Um, all that I can really say is that I just wish everybody the best in 2021. Happy New Year. 
I hope that all of your families stay safe and stay healthy. Um, and I really hope that we're able to take care of um, this pandemic with this vaccine and get back to a more normal life. I am very, very grateful for all the business that everybody has given this company over the past two years. And, um, and we are just really hoping to be able to provide you with a lot of added benefit as the years go on. There's a lot of really cool things in the works. Some of it you're going to start seeing on the January, February, and March in-service training. Um, but man, we are we are working our tails off, and we're just trying to make sure we're able to provide you with the best possible inspection that we can. Um, anyway, thank you so much. Um, I hope everybody's family is doing well in 2021. Uh, I hope that we are moving forward so much better in 2021, and I'm really, really excited um, for what this new year is going to bring. Thank you again for watching these videos. Thank you again um, for learning with us, and um, just thank you. Have a wonderful day, and if you do have any questions, please uh, feel free to call us, send us an email, text message, whatever, to moosehomeinspections.com. If you've already found this video, that means you've at least found our YouTube channel, and uh, we hope to see you very soon to do inspection. Have a wonderful day.